Thank you. Um, so just a quick overview of what we do. So we run the largest uh, tech ecosystem platform in Southeast Asia. So this includes uh, media where we cover uh, stories, uh, investment news, trends and updates on what's happening across the entire Southeast Asian region. Uh, we have a startups database that has got about 20, 30,000 companies. Uh, we've got a jobs platform, an events platform. Uh, and essentially, we bring the whole ecosystem together online. And on the offline side, we also run the largest tech conference in Southeast Asia. So it brings together about 10,000 people. Uh, I think events are really, really important. Uh, so I'm glad that this event is happening and has been going on for a few years. So I would strongly encourage all of you to support the event organizers because it's important to gather face to face. It's important to discuss ideas and to find partnerships and opportunities to work together with the different stakeholders. So I'm going to jump right in, right? Um, so for most of you who know Southeast Asia, some might have been there for holiday, some might have read about it a bit online. Some people know Indonesia as purely Bali. Uh, Southeast Asia is a mix of 11 countries, um, 650 million people. Um, the interesting thing about this is that 700 million of them are mobile. So you have a lot of cities or countries where people have more than one phone. Uh, a lot of them are actually very young. So if you go to Vietnam, for example, 50% uh, of the population is actually aged uh, 25 and below. So you have a very young consumer-centric uh, uh, market. Um, the economy is actually one of the largest, uh, and it's going to be one of the largest internet economies by 2020. Uh, it currently is the fastest growing internet economy in the world. And by 2023 or 2025, it will probably be among the top three internet economies globally. So there's a lot to learn, right, by the rise of this region. All of this pretty much only happened in the last uh, six to eight years. Uh, very rapid growth. Uh, but there's also a lot of challenges. I think one of the big ones is the, the fact that the languages uh, and the cultures are completely different all across the region. 11 countries, but way more than 11 languages spoken. Um, the, the issues also with regulatory are, are, are a bit of a challenge. Uh, the regulation frameworks around the region are not very mature. Uh, in most cases, the government is uh, very supportive, uh, but it's been, a, it's been a challenge working with the government. Currencies are also a big problem, and that's where fintech has a lot of opportunity. But in a nutshell, it's a very vibrant, fast-growing ecosystem that I think all of you can look at uh, to learn, to see what you can adapt from there to, to, to this region, or maybe even look at expanding uh, uh, down the road. I wanted to bring up some of the headlines, uh, and this is specifically headlines from this week. So you actually get a sense, right, of what's popular and what's actually happening in the ecosystem. And, and you know from, uh, from, from that sense where, where it is at, right? So on the top left, we have uh, Grab launching the electric vehicles uh, in Indonesia, and this too with the government support. So Grab is the Decacon of Southeast Asia, uh, more than 10 billion in funding. It's the Uber equivalent, but they don't just do ride hailing. They do everything from food delivery to payments to, to entertainments. Right? Uh, they are potentially the, the future uh, version of the banks in the region. Now, Grab is launching electric vehicles and that too with government support. And the key thing here is this, right? if you want to succeed in Southeast Asia, you really have to uh, work with government to help you roll out some of the big plans you have. The second one on the right, Gojek, which is Grab's biggest competitor. I'll do a bit of comparison between these two later on. But Gojek actually uh, acquired a company that is doing a POS solution for SaaS companies. Now, this is another major thing, right? The, the enterprisation of companies regionally, the fact that a lot of mom and pop shops and uh, small and medium enterprises are going heavily digital is a massive trend in Southeast Asia. And this is where Grab, Goja and organizations like these are on an acquisition spree for, for companies like that. The third one being a bank. So the banks are also very, very active. So in this particular case, uh, uh, the largest bank in Indonesia uh, coming up with a $14 million plan to invest in fintech. So the traditional organizations are also, they also don't want to lose out, right? So you have large corporates, you have banks, uh, you've got your traditional large family-run organizations that are very, very active in building companies as well as investing in companies. Uh, the fourth one on the right is uh, health. So health is actually very, very early and it might not be very, uh, uh, um, it might not be something very popular here now, but as the ecosystem in Southeast Asia rises, as the middle class start to make more money, uh, health becomes a massive opportunity. You know, rich people you know, eat healthy, unhealthier food, uh, they have worse lifestyles, so health is a good opportunity. But a deeper problem is that Southeast Asia actually has one of the largest uh, instances of diabetes. Uh, and with diabetes come a, a, a whole bunch of other chronic diseases. So this is an example of a company that raised uh, $40 million 
specifically for kidney dialysis uh, related stuff. Um, the next one is uh, car platform. So I'm sure car platform, car marketplaces are massive around the world. But here's an interesting take, right? These car platforms wants to launch fintech related services so they can do loans. And, and one thing that I wanted to highlight, operationally profitable by end 2020. So this is a massive new thing in Southeast Asia where companies are starting to realize they cannot rely purely on venture funding to grow and becoming profitable is a very, very critical thing. The second last big news from this week is Russia's uh, technology coming into Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is one of those markets right, where global technologies want to come in and figure out how to localize them, how to adapt them. The same thing can be done with you guys, right? Nepalese technology. The same thing is being done with Taiwanese technology, Chinese technology, uh, uh, American, European technology. So people realize that Southeast Asia has a market potential, but there might be not enough innovations happening regionally. And this is where a lot of foreign companies are working with the local governments and local organizations to figure out how they can bring technology in. And lastly, mobility. Mobility is a massive, massive thing in Southeast Asia right now. Uh, in this particular case, it's more of the, um, um, the skate scooters, the bikes. Uh, and in this case, a Singaporean company is expanding in markets like Australia and New Zealand. Now, this is where regulation has become a problem. Just recently, PMDs, personal mobility devices, got banned. So suddenly, this company was in, was in shambles, right? But they were able to find opportunities outside of the Southeast Asia region, uh, in the Australia and uh, New Zealand region. So I hope this gives a bit of a sense of the maturity of the ecosystem, uh, the stages of the company, uh, and hopefully you all can find some interesting opportunities. So next up, um, we did a bit of a, a report uh, in 2018. Uh, the 2019 report is not ready because the year is not over, but we put together a financial report that I will share with you, uh, as well as a sectoral report. So you have a sense of how mature the, the ecosystem is. In 2018 alone, close to $24 billion in funding was raised in Southeast Asia alone. Let's dig deeper into that, right? We break it down by countries. Now, if you look at it, right, we've covered only um, six of the top countries because the rest, uh, from a statistical standpoint, were not very significant. But if you look at Singapore, Singapore dominates in terms of total funding raise, uh, $12 billion. Number of companies that uh, raised money was also the highest. So the distribution of companies raising money in Singapore is a lot, lot larger. Average of about $30 million raised per company. As opposed to, for example, Indonesia, where $8 billion was raised, but that, com that only went to about 120 companies, meaning that about average $75 million was raised per company. Now, why is this important to all of you, right? A, it's important to appreciate, right, that more mature markets like Indonesia and Southeast Asia, the funding activities and the investment activities are all more driven towards later stage companies. So if you're an investor looking to go into these markets, there is an opportunity for you to play a role in the earlier stage side because the later stage sides are dominated fairly heavily by the local players. If you're a company that wants to expand, markets like Vietnam, Philippines are, something, are areas to look at because not, many, not much funding is being raised so you can go in and potentially compete with uh, uh, some of the local startups if you're able to raise funding from here. For the larger organizations as well, if you're a startup, you might be better off partnering with the larger startups as opposed to raising money and expanding locally. So just a, a bar chart, right? As you can see, uh, average amount of money raised by Indonesia is, uh, dominates um, a lot of the other uh, uh, markets. And this makes perfect sense, right? Because Indonesia is such a large country. Total market size is 250 million. So if you want to do any real business activity in Indonesia, you have to raise a significant amount of money to go into that market. So if you're looking to expand into Indonesia, you can't be raising like five to $10 million and expecting to make an impact. You have to be looking to raise a lot more than that. Industry verticals. I think this is interesting for us to know what are the popular industry verticals that exist in Southeast Asia so that you guys, with the companies that you all are building or the companies that you all are working in, you all can see whether there's a fit. Um, so the top five would be uh, general internet companies, e-commerce, software, mobile, and enterprise tech. So bear in mind, this was again 2018. Uh, by this time round, the, the, the data has changed a bit. I would say fintech, uh, logistics, transports, and property have definitely risen in 2019 as compared to 2018. So what does this mean for you, right? If you guys are in the logistics, transport, prop tech space, massive opportunity for you to look at Southeast Asia because there are no major dominant players. If you're in the fintech space, mobile space, enterprise space, it's going to be a lot, lot harder. 
So look at partnership opportunities instead of going in completely on your own. But I hope this gives a general uh, overview. Areas like education, travel and healthcare, they're somewhere in the middle. So there is interest there, but they haven't gone that much of a mainstream yet. Now, these are the two most exciting companies in Southeast Asia, Grab and Gojek. They're fundamentally the Uber equivalents, but very, very uh, stark differences as to how these two companies were built. The fun fact is that both the founders of these companies were actually schoolmates at Harvard. So they knew each other uh, for a long time. So in some sense, um, they do have a similar background uh, in terms of wanting to build uh, companies that help solve major problems in their markets. Uh, in, again, this is uh, uh, 2018's data. So Grab has raised a lot more money, but it's also a lot more of a regional company. Um, they were mainly in the ride-hailing transport payments and food space, whereas Gojek uh, was in the ride-hailing space, but actually invested a lot in the entertainment and lifestyle areas. By lifestyle, I mean that in the early days, you could actually order massage services, cleaning services, um, manicure, pedicure services to your home, as opposed to stuff in Grab, where it's mainly food and, and ride-hailing. So you can see, right, very, very similar companies, but both completely uh, grew in different ways. One thing to note, right, Grab always uh, took the super app model. They had one main dominant app, and they, they focused on growing that app. The only time they had it separate was when they launched their food delivery service, but they merged it very quickly. Gojek, on the other hand, played a very different game. In the very early days, they had verticalized apps. So they had one app for lifestyle, one app for entertainment, one app for ride hailing, one app for food. Now they're in the midst of merging everything together, but just for your own benefit, right, as they are regionalizing now, they're going to places like Malaysia, Vietnam, they're actually launching country-centric uh, apps. So if I'm a Gojek user in Indonesia versus a Gojek user in Vietnam, the app I use is going to be completely different. Now, I, I wouldn't say, I think it's a bit too early to tell whether this is a right or wrong strategy, but it's more of this is a completely different strategy that these two companies are, are applying. Now, something to note about the investors in Southeast Asia. Singapore obviously has the major trump of uh, uh, investors based in, Singapore, in, in Southeast Asia. So if you're funding, if you want to raise money, um, it, no questions asked, right? You should definitely go to Singapore. Now, here's the tricky thing though. It doesn't mean that the Singapore investors are only investing in Singapore startups. A lot of them are regional investors. A lot of them are non-Singapore investors, but parking their funds in Singapore. So that's something that you have to be mindful about. Singapore is like the financial hub for investment, but that it does not necessarily mean that the money will only go to Singapore companies uh, or Singapore-based companies. Something that has changed uh, over the last three years quite a bit. In Southeast Asia previously, uh, most investors did not want to lead investments. And that has completely changed. So as of 2018, right, based on our data, right, close to 70% of investors were willing to lead investment rounds. So if you're looking to raise money, right, same thing, right, you don't have to go to an American investor. You could actually raise money from a Southeast Asian investor and they would actually be open to leading an investment round in some of your companies. Now, I'll, let me share very quickly on um, how is it that you could potentially understand Southeast Asia better if you would want to explore the market and if you decide to go penetrate the market, the suggested approach that I would share with all of you. The three things that I would suggest is uh, events, government programs, and the last one is a strategic country or city-based approach. Here's a snapshot of all the events that happened uh, in 2018. And these are the major tech conferences that happen. Some of them are government run, some of them are private run, like, like organizations like ours. So I would highly encourage all of you to put these events uh, in your map for 2019 and plan and structure your schedule around these events if you do plan to visit. Of course, I'm biased, I'll ask you to come to my event in, uh, in May, May 14, right? Uh, but there are many other interesting events that you should definitely look at depending on the markets you want to go. So one example is TechCrunch uh, China, which is typically in November. Um, there's the Tectonic event in Philippines, if you want to know more about, about the ecosystem in June. And then our Echelon event is in May. So events are a very important way uh, to get to know the ecosystem well. Southeast Asia is one of those markets where people actually do enjoy coming to events. You will get high quality people coming and that includes government, corporates, startups, and investors. 
So don't think that events are just places where people go and mingle and have fun. Actual deals do get done at these events. Actual business matching, matchmaking does happen. So do take these events very seriously. Okay, government grants. Now, most countries globally, working with governments and, and, and matching that with startups might not be uh, the right thing to do. But Southeast Asia is a different animal in that standpoint. If you want to do well in Southeast Asia, you have to work with government. You have to figure out which are the right agencies you work with and how do you align your interests with this. As you saw in the news that I shared earlier, right, when Grab wanted to launch electric vehicles in Indonesia, they heavily work with the Indonesian government. So I've shared some uh, government agencies across the different governments. Uh, in some sense, this is ranked by how mature and active the governments are. Um, I, I think these slides should be available after, but I won't go into too much detail. But in general, right, it's important to realize a few things. One is figure out what is the objective and KPIs of the agency. So in this particular case, Enterprise Singapore, their objectives and KPIs is to develop countries, the companies based in Singapore and to bring Singapore companies out to satellite cities. If your objectives are aligned with them, you should definitely go and work with them. Uh, SG Innovate, which is a, a government-linked private company, their entire initiative is around building deep tech companies. So if you don't have a deep tech company, if your company doesn't do anything with blockchain, AI, data analytics, then approaching SG Innovate might not be the right thing to do. So these are four of the, and then MAS, which is the Monetary Authority of Singapore, they are more of a central bank, but they organize the largest fintech event in the world. That was just over in November, like where 60,000 people attended. So if any of you are doing anything in the fintech space, this is probably the, the agency you definitely want to talk to, and fintech festival is most definitely the event you want to attend. And then in Malaysia, these are the three dominant uh, agencies. On the top, you have MDEC, which is a highly active agency that looks at developing local ecosystem as well as bringing companies out. And especially for foreign companies, they do have a lot of incentives to help you grow the teams there, provide grants and opportunities. Organizations like Cradle are more for investments. And then Thailand, something similar. NIA is more for external, DIPA is more for internal. So if you go to DIPA and, if you go to DIPA and ask them to help you with external stuff, uh, it won't be the right uh, conversation. And then Startup Thailand is the uh, massive 40,000 pax Thailand event that they have. The thing about government agencies that you all need to remember, uh, as even though all of them are working for the same government, they're all very competitive. So if you go to one government agency, and if the KPIs are not aligned with them, they're not going to point you to the right government agency. Most of the time, you'll have to figure that out by accident. So always do your homework and research before approaching these organizations so you are well aware of what their KPIs are and then you can better approach them with what your plans are. Uh, Indonesia has these three uh, or four companies, uh, agencies, sorry. Now, Indonesia's government agencies are active but not as active as the first three countries. And the main reason is this. Indonesia government knows this as well. Most of the companies that have uh, developed in Indonesia, the Unicorns, Gojek, Bukalapa, all of them really develop with very minimal government support. So the government knows that they don't really have that big of a hand in developing the ecosystem that much. So they're more of a support ancillary kind of organization. They're not super heavily handed in developing the ecosystem. Uh, the last two is Vietnam and Philippines. Now these two, are, these two countries have very, very uh, early agencies. Most of them have just started uh, actively investing in the startup ecosystem. Uh, so you might not get a lot done, but I think it's still very important that you build an early relationship with them, especially if these two markets are important for you. Um, I'm almost done, right? So, okay, so this is something, right? If you're expanding to Southeast Asia, you have to decide early on whether you want to take a city-based approach or a country-based approach. And there's no right or wrong here, right? There are many tier one cities across Southeast Asia. So the examples I provided are Jakarta, Bangkok, Kuala Lumpur, Manila, for example. The thing about tier one cities is that, generally speaking, the affluency is more or less the same, the languages are more or less the same, English, the infrastructure is more or less the same, and the cultural usage of technology is more or less the same, right? A except for some local differences, the general ecosystem in Manila versus the general ecosystem in Jakarta should be similar. Note that I'm not using Thailand, uh, I'm not using Philippines and Indonesia. On the flip side, right, if you start going to tier two cities, right, that's where things become tricky and different. So in Indonesia, for example, Jakarta is a tier one city. If you start going to tier two cities like Malang, 
Jogja, Surabaya and Bandung, the entire approach to those markets completely changes because they don't behave like tier one cities. And you need to be aware of that. And this is where, right, you need to be clear whether you want to follow Grab's model of regionalization where they did a city-based approach. First launch in Jakarta, then launch in Bangkok, then launch in Manila, before launching in the deeper cities uh, regionally. Or you want to follow Gojek, where they were super deep in Indonesia and they penetrated all the different facets and cities in Indonesia. And then once they, were, they had dominated their market, they started going to Vietnam, then they started going to Philippines. So there's no right or wrong here, right? It's really dependent on your strategy. Now, the, the part that becomes dangerous is the kind of services, the kind of relationships, the kind of technology, the tools you build for a city-based approach versus a country-based approach is completely different. So all the stuff that Gojek built for Indonesia, for example, a lot of it is not relevant or applicable to Vietnam or Philippines. And this means that they have to rebuild it again. But on the flip side, whatever Gojek did in Indonesia is so deeply uh, entrenched that Grab till today is still having a very, very hard time fighting them in Indonesia. Okay, that pretty much ends it. This is my last slide. So in summary, right, if you want to be successful in, in, uh, in um, Southeast Asia, right, these are the few things you need to think about, right? Firstly is that you need to be more, you need to play a more partnership-centric role. And this is gov could be government partnerships, could be corporate partnerships. So before you go in, right, think of partners you can work with, Try and work on win-win situations. Be less competitive-centric, competitive-driven, and figure out market entry through uh, partnerships. Make sure you are hyper-localized in terms of understanding the language, the cultural differences of the markets, especially based on the analogy I gave earlier on the city and country-based approach. And always, always remember and understand the business cultures. The business culture in Singapore is completely different from Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia. Take some time to study that, take some time to appreciate that because that will help you go a long way right, in making sure that you reduce the number of mistakes you make in the early days. Uh, I think my time is more or less done. Uh, this is my contact if anybody wants to, to get in touch to better understand uh, uh, more about Southeast Asia and I, and I hope uh, the session was helpful for all of you. Thank you very much.